On April 23rd of 2013, the Associated Press put out the following tweet. It said, breaking news, two explosions at the White House and Barack Obama has been injured. This tweet was retweeted more than 4,000 times in less than five minutes, and it went viral immediately thereafter. But this tweet was not real news. This was false news that was propagated by Syrian hackers that had infiltrated the AP Twitter handle. Their purpose was to disrupt society, but they disrupted much more because automated trading algorithms immediately seized on the sentiment on this tweet and began trading based on the potential that the president of the United States had been injured or killed in this explosion. And as they started tweeting, they immediately sent the stock market crashing, wiping out $140 billion in equity value in a single day. Earlier this year, Robert Mueller, special counsel prosecutor in the United States, issued indictments against three Russian companies and 13 Russian individuals on a conspiracy to defraud the United States by meddling in the 2016 presidential election. And what this indictment tells as a story is the story of the Internet Research Agency, the shadowy arm of the Kremlin on social media, housed in this nondescript building in St. Petersburg with four stories dedicated to the creation and propagation of fake news and misinformation on Twitter, Facebook, and all other social media platforms. During the presidential election alone, the internet agency's efforts reached 126 million people on Facebook in the United States, issued 3 million individual tweets, and 43 hours worth of YouTube content, all of which was fake, misinformation designed to sow discord uh, in the US presidential election. A recent study by Oxford University showed that in the recent Swedish elections, a full third, one third of all of the information spreading on social media about the election was fake or misinformation. And these types of misinformation don't just affect economies and democracies, but when we talk about first responders that are responding to a terrorist attack or responding to a natural disaster, Misinformation spreading about where the terrorists are or which building people are trapped in can mean minutes lost and therefore lives lost. In addition, these types of social media misinformation campaigns can spread what has been called genocidal propaganda. For instance, against the Rohingya in Burma or recently on WhatsApp triggering mob killings in India. If you see the quote at the bottom of the page, it says, fake news is blamed for influencing elections in the West, but in India, it's killing people. We studied fake news and began studying it before it was a popular term. And we recently published uh, the largest ever longitudinal study of the spread of fake news online on the cover of Science in March of this year. We studied all of the verified true and false news stories that ever spread on Twitter from its inception in 2006 to the present day, 2017, in fact. And when we studied this information, we studied verified news stories that were verified by six independent fact-checking organizations. So we knew which stories were true and which stories were false. This is an example of the type of information we had. In red, you see the rise and fall of false news stories over time. In green, true news stories over time. And in yellow, an insidious category that we called mixed news, which contained information that was partially true and partially false. Some of the most difficult to root out and some of the most difficult for people to discern. This is a graph of the false political news that was spreading during this period. And you see it rise and fall. You see spikes of false news during the US presidential elections on Twitter. And you see one massive spike of mixed information uh, during the annexation of Crimea. It begins and ends during that one and a half month period that Crimea was annexed. 
I tell this story of the Crimean annexation and the role of misinformation and fake news in my upcoming book, The Hype Machine. I will save that story for you uh, in the book. This is what these cascades look like. These are cascades of true and false information on Twitter. The larger red cascade is a false news tweet, the green one a true news tweet, and it begins with a starburst pattern of retweets at the beginning of the cascade. And then you see these dendrils like jellyfish emanating from the starburst, one person retweeting another and retweeting another and retweeting another. And these types of structures have mathematical properties. We can measure their diffusion, the speed of their diffusion, the depth and breadth of their diffusion, how many people become entangled in this information cascade, and so on. And what we did in this paper was we compared the spread of true news to the spread of false news. And here's what we found. We found that false news diffused further, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in every category of information that we studied, sometimes by an order of magnitude. And in fact, false political news was the most viral. It diffused further, faster, deeper, and more broadly than any other type of false news. When we saw these results, we were at once worried, but also curious. Why? Why does false news travel so much further, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth? The first hypothesis that we came up with was, well, maybe people who spread false news have more followers, or follow more people, or tweet more often, or maybe they're more often verified users of Twitter with more credibility, or maybe they've been on Twitter longer. So we checked each one of these in turn. And what we found was exactly the opposite. False news spreaders had fewer followers, followed fewer people, were less active, less often verified, and had been on Twitter for a shorter period of time. And yet, false news was 70% more likely to be retweeted than the truth, controlling for all of these and many other factors. So we had to come up with other explanations. And we devised what we called a novelty hypothesis. So if you read the literature, it is well known that human attention is drawn to novelty, things that are new in the environment. And if you read the sociology literature, you know that we like to share novel information because it makes us seem like we're in the know. It makes us seem like we have access to inside information and we gain in status by spreading this kind of information. So what we did was we measured the novelty of an incoming true or false tweet compared to the corpus of what that individual had seen in the 60 days prior on Twitter. So we used information theoretic measures of the information content in these true or false tweets compared to all of the information that they had seen in the 60 days prior to this incoming true or false tweet, and we measured information novelty across three distinct measures. And across all of these measures, false news was much more novel than the truth. But that wasn't enough, because we thought to ourselves, well, maybe false news is more novel in an information theoretic sense, but maybe people don't perceive it as more novel. So to understand people's perceptions of false news, we looked at the information and the sentiment contained in the replies to true and false tweets. And what we found was that across a bunch of different measures of sentiment, surprise, disgust, fear, sadness, anticipation, joy, and trust, false news exhi exhibited significantly more surprise and disgust in the replies to false tweets. And true news exhibited significantly more anticipation, joy, and trust in reply to true tweets. The surprise corroborates our novelty hypothesis. This is new and surprising and so we're more likely to share it. At the same time, there was congressional testimony in front of both houses of Congress in the United States looking at the role of bots in the spread of misinformation. So we looked at this too. We used multiple sophisticated bot detection algorithms to find the bots in our data and to pull them out. So we pulled them out, we put them back in, and we compared what happens to our measurements when we remove the bots and when we put them back in. And what we found was that, yes, indeed, bots were accelerating the spread of false news online. 
but they were accelerating the spread of true news at approximately the same rate, which means bots are not responsible for the differential diffusion of truth and falsity online. We can't abdicate that responsibility because we, humans, are responsible for that spread. Now, everything that I have told you so far, unfortunately for all of us, is the good news. The reason is because it's about to get a whole lot worse. And two specific technologies are going to make it worse. We are going to see the rise of a tremendous wave of synthetic media, fake video, fake audio, that is very convincing to the human eye. And this will be powered by two technologies. The first of these is known as generative adversarial networks. This is a machine learning model with two networks, a discriminator, whose job it is to determine whether something is true or false, and a generator, whose job it is to generate synthetic media. So the synthetic generator generates synthetic video or audio, and the discriminator tries to tell, is this real or is this fake? And then the generator sees what the discriminator does and optimizes a function to generate more and more convincing video and audio. And in fact, it is the job of the generator to maximize the likelihood that it will fool the discriminator into thinking the synthetic video and audio that it is creating is actually true. Imagine a machine in a hyperloop trying to get better and better at fooling us. This combined with a second technology, which is essentially the democratization of artificial intelligence to the people. The ability for anyone without any background in artificial intelligence or machine learning to deploy these kinds of algorithms to generate synthetic ma media makes it ultimately so much easier to create videos like this one. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you, and stay woke, bitches. In fact, just recently, the White House issued a false doctored video of a journalist interacting with an intern who was trying to take his microphone. They removed frames from this video in order to make his actions seem more punchy. And when videographers and stuntmen and women were interviewed about this type of technique, they said, yes, we use this in the movies all the time to make our punches and kicks look more choppy and more aggressive. They then put out this video and partly used it as justification to revoke Jim Acosta, the reporter's press pass, uh, from the White House. And CNN had to sue to have that press pass reinstated. There are about five different paths that I can think of that we can follow to try and address some of these very difficult problems today. Each one of them has promise, but each one of them has its own challenges. The first one is labeling. Think about it this way. When you go to the grocery store to buy food to consume, it's extensively labeled. You know how many calories it has, how much fat it contains, how many trans fats it has, whether it's been produced in a facility that produces wheat or peanuts, if you have an allergy. And yet, when we consume information, we have no labels whatsoever. 
what is contained in this information? Is it true or false? Does this source typically put out true information or false information? Is the source credible? Where is this information gathered from? How many reporters worked on this story? What is the policy of this journal in terms of running with a fact? Do they need to have two independent sources or three? We have none of that information when we are consuming information. That is a potential avenue, but it comes with its challenges. For instance, who gets to decide in society what's true and what's false? Is it the governments? Is it Facebook? Is it an independent consortium of fact checkers? And who's checking the fact checkers? Another potential avenue is incentives. We know that during the US presidential election, there was a wave of misinformation that came from Macedonia that didn't have any political motive, but instead had an economic motive. And this economic motive existed because false news travels so much farther, faster, and more deeply than the truth, and you can earn advertising dollars as you garner eyeballs and attention with this type of information. But if we can depress the spread of this information, perhaps it would reduce the economic incentive to produce it at all in the first place. Third, we can think about regulation. And certainly we should think about this option. In the United States currently, we are exploring what might happen if Facebook and others are regulated. Recently in Europe, uh, the GDPR went into effect at the end of May, instituting strict privacy policies and uses of data and algorithmic transparency requirements. But this type of regulation, while we should consider things like regulating political speech, labeling the fact that it's political speech, making sure foreign actors can't fund political speech, it also has its own dangers. For instance, Malaysia just instituted a six-year prison sentence for anyone found spreading misinformation. And in authoritarian regimes, these kinds of policies can be used to suppress minority opinions and to continue to extend repression. The fourth possible option is transparency. We want to know, how do Facebook's algorithms work? How does the data combine with the algorithms to produce the outcomes that we see. We want them to open the kimono and show us exactly the inner workings of how Facebook is working. And if we want to know social media's effect on society, we need scientists, researchers, and others to have access to this kind of information. But at the same time, we are asking Facebook to lock everything down, to keep all of the data secure, to not give data to third parties like Cambridge University, who then gave the data to Cambridge Analytica that created that scandal. So Facebook and the other social media platforms are facing what I call a transparency paradox. We are asking them at the same time to be open and transparent and simultaneously secure. This is a very difficult needle to thread, but they will need to thread this needle if we are to achieve the promise of social technologies while avoiding their peril. The final thing that we could think about is algorithms and machine learning, technology devised to root out and understand fake news, how it spreads, and to try and dampen its flow. Humans have to be in the loop of this technology because we can never escape that underlying any technological solution or approach is a fundamental ethical and philosophical question about how do we define truth and falsity? To whom do we give the power to define truth and falsity? And which opinions are legitimate? Which type of speech should be allowed? And so on. Technology is not a solution for that. Ethics and philosophy is a solution for that. Nearly every theory of human decision-making, human cooperation, and human coordination has some sense of the truth at its core. But with the rise of fake news, the rise of fake video, the rise of fake audio, we are teetering on the brink of the end of reality, where we cannot tell what is real from what is fake. And that's potentially incredibly dangerous. We have to be vigilant in defending the truth against misinformation with our technologies, with our policies, 
and perhaps most importantly, with our own individual responsibilities, decisions, behaviors, and actions. Thank you very much.